consider these two chapters, 10 and 11, and uh, in our series of Time to Come. And last week we, we had a review, caught up, kind of a refresher of what has taken place, what we studied last year, and uh, tonight we're going to pick up. Uh, we are now closer towards the midpoint of the tribulation period. Uh, we've dealt with the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and now we're moving towards a more of the middle, the middle of that period. And um, I might turn my. Oh, there we go. All right. So we we considered we considered in the past week we looked at all the events that are taking place, the rapture of the church, and then the seven year period is ushered in. The hundred forty four thousand witnesses will become those evangelists throughout the world preaching. The church is not here. The temple is rebuilt. Um, and uh, the different judgments are beginning to come down uh, upon this world. And so we get now closer towards the middle of that period of time. We're into the three and a half year. Uh, we're getting towards the middle and we pick up now the story there. In chapters 10 and 11, chapters 10 and 11 of the book of Revelation is a prelude to what is yet to come. It's a prelude to the second half of the tribulation period. And so we see three testimonies. And this is what we are talking about tonight. There are three testimonies in those two chapters. There's the testimony of a mighty angel, the testimony of the two witnesses, we'll talk about them a little bit, and the testimony of the elders in Revelation 11, which is associated with the seventh trumpet. We've covered that uh, when we did the trumpet judgments, but we'll go back and the, uh, tonight and add them uh, into these three testimonies. Now, these three testimonies uh, that are given in Revelation 10 and 11 are to justify or to show that Jesus is going to win. Right? Jesus is going to triumph. I don't know about you, but that excites me. Uh, so here's the, the three testimonies are going to give evidence... And they're going to give testimony to the world, a testimony in heaven, a testimony to John as he writes, that, they, that Jesus is sovereign king, he is king of kings and lord of lords. And though we might think that the Gentile world in all of their craziness and wickedness are, are presiding and are getting away with things, no, the Lord is going to bring them to account and judgment is going to fall upon the earth. So as we read through, Romans, uh, through Revelation chapter 10 and 11, we'll see the account of these three testimonies. And I've got uh, some of those things summarized in our handouts tonight. So let's take our, our Bibles and open up to Revelation. And we're going to read Revelation chapter 10, chapter 10 verses 1 through to 11, which is a chapter dedicated about this mighty angel. We'll read that and uh, then we'll take some note of it. The Bible says this, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swore by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that, are, that, that therein are, and, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, and that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets." And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is opened in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. 
And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before, my pe before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. We'll stop there for the time being and we'll continue with chapter 11 as we progress through our study. Let's pray. Father, we just need you now. Help us to be alert. Uh, Lord, we, we would be tired. The, the flesh is weak, uh, but the spirit is strong and willing. So Lord, help us tonight as we learn together uh, these events that are taking place and Lord, we just want to study your word. You've revealed it to us. Help us to understand it this evening, that it change us, that we would be ready for your return. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so here is a vision here. Uh, John sees this mighty angel who comes down to this earth and has one foot on the sea, in the sea and one foot on earth. And he has a little book in his hand. So let's have a look at the description of this mighty angel and uh, how we conclude who this angel could be. So number one, it says he's a mighty angel. He, has, uh, he is strong. Uh, in fact, in Revelation chapter 5, Revelation 5 and verse 2 says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Uh, we, uh, we don't know. There is no name given to this angel. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we, all we know is that uh, he, was, he has power and authority. And the Bible continues to say that he is clothed with a cloud. Now we know through the New Testament, even the Old Testament, the Lord led his people with a cloud by day. And when the glory, Shekinah, glory of God appeared into the tabernacle or even in the temple of, that Solomon built, the Bible tells us that the cloud came and rested upon it. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus, when he ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1, what, what do the disciples see? They see Jesus being taken up into the clouds. And the angel said to them, this same Jesus which is taken up before you shall come in so like manner. And we know when Jesus comes to take the church, we will meet him in the air. And uh, later on, in, at the end of the tribulation period, when he returns at, at the end of the tribulation to deliver the children of Israel, the Bible says that he will return in a cloud. So here there's some indications. We're trying to get some glimpses. There's some indications that this may possibly be the Lord Jesus uh, in the form of this mighty angel. All right, number three, the rainbow upon his head. Now, the rainbow in, in Revelation chapter 4 was around the throne of God, which this would appear to that he has authority given to him by God. Uh, he has the face like the sun, uh, bright and shining. And, and uh, so another indication that this could be the Lord Jesus himself. And his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon uh, the uh, upon the upon the land. Now this will demonstrate that he has authority, uh, the ability that he he reigns supreme. He reigns supreme over the whole earth. He reigns supreme over the oceans and over the sea and all that is in the sea, and he reigns supreme over earth, over every creature living uh, on this earth. Uh, he reigns supreme and he has authority over them. So this is what this is indicating. And the Bible says, and when the seven uh, and uh, uh, sorry, verse three. And he cried with a loud voice, and when, uh, as when a lion roareth. And that, uh, let me just say that when the Lord Jesus speaks, uh, he is not like Satan, the lion who seeks whom he may devour. He is a roaring lion of great authority and power, and that's what this uh, this speaks of. And so we find that, that he has this book. And, uh, and seven thunders uh, uttered a message. We don't know what that message is. We don't know what John heard, but he heard something. And when he took his pen to scribe down what he heard, the voice said to him, you are to shut up that, see, that, that vision. You are not to write it. You're not to tell it. Uh, you're, not, you're not even to uh, you know, uh, uh, prophesy it to anybody else. So we don't know what was said to him. But in fact, here we see that someone communicated to him some great mystery of God, a great mystery of God. And, and the mystery of God relates to how God deals with evil. And uh, we'll, we'll look at that further uh, in his declaration. But it, there was a loud voice, like a roaring lion. 
and he spoke seven statements that were forbidden to be recorded, and he stood with his hand raised up like an oath. And this particular angel standing there, having one foot in the sea, one foot on land, stands with his hand raised up, and he takes an oath. He takes an oath about what is going to take place. He swears by heaven and on earth and things on the earth and that these things are going to happen. These, well, the, the end of time is coming. And uh, so we'll look at that declaration of what this uh, angel is saying. So in all likelihood, when we see all this description, in all likelihood, this would seem to be the appearance of Jesus to John. The appearance of Jesus Christ to John as that mighty angel. Well, what did he say? What was his declaration? Well, with his hand lifted up, he's affirming and the certainty of the words, certainty of what will take place here on earth. Uh, there will be no more delays. Uh, here he says in verse 6, uh, the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. There will be no more delays to the execution of judgment, uh, of bringing an end to wickedness here on earth. Remember, the, uh, on, the, on the fifth seal, all those who were martyred were before the throne of God and saying, Lord, how long? How long will it be before you avenge our blood? How long will you avenge what, took to, what, what happened to us? And he says, uh, just for a little while. Just wait a little while long. There are more who will be martyred and added to you. And now we get to that middle point, and uh, here we find uh, this angel saying, the delay is over. Uh, there is victory for Christ, uh, there is going to be judgment, there's going to be the final judgment that God is going to pour upon the wickedness and the evil of this world. And so there's no more delays uh, for that execution. All right, number three, the mystery of God. Uh, what is this mystery of God? Well, the mystery of God is how would God, how is God dealing with evil? Uh, how, how, would, how is God going to deal with evil? H has God dealt with evil already? Yes, he has. He, he judged Jesus Christ on our behalf. He's dealt with evil and wickedness and sin. He has pay, he, Jesus made payment for the sins of the world and for your sin and my sin. So he's dealt with it. But now he's going to deal with those who reject. Those who reject the offer of mercy. Those who reject the salvation that is provided in Jesus Christ. And so uh, the Lord is, is going to deal and finish up this mystery uh, that, God, uh, that God in time past has dealt with the evil of this world. Uh, so the signal for this mystery completion is the sounding of the seventh trumpet. So this is what's going to take place. We know that the seventh, the seventh seal unfolded the seven trumpets, and now the last trumpet judgment, the seventh trumpet, is going to unfold the seven bowls judgments or the vile judgments that are going to be so severe on the kingdoms of this world that have rejected Christ and followed the Antichrist. And so when will this place take place? The angel says, when? When that seventh trumpet is blown, uh, that will unfold the last judgments that will pour out upon this world. It will be the last half of the tribulation where now uh, that, that God will pour out his great judgment and complete, fulfill the wrath of God. Now, the directions that the angel gave to John uh, should remind us of our responsibility. The angel said to him, go take the word and eat it. It will be sweet in your mouth, but bitter in your belly. Uh, Jeremiah said that I have found thy word to be as sweet as honey. And the Word of God is sweet to our taste. But when the Word of God begins to talk about judgment to come, it should make us a little bit disturbed, don't you think? It should make us think about, well, what great tragedy is going to take place here on earth. And it should distress us a little bit that there may be loved ones, there might be those who we know that are not listening to the gospel call that will go through these severe judgments. And so it should cause us some distress, but we ought to take in the Word of God. Interesting that God did not force the Word into John. He invited him. He said to him, come and take the book. And God will not force his Word inside you. You need to take the initiative. You need to be willing to 
to read the Word, to study the Word, to make it part of you, to live according to what it says, and it will be sweet to your life. It will be a great blessing to your life. It will help you tremendously. It will help your children, help your families, help your marriage. It will help us in this present world. It will be sweet to you. But there will be parts when we read about the judgment of God, about how God is dissatisfied with the weakness of men that should cause some bitterness in our bellies. The word uh, will impact our lives. This word will impact our lives. Uh, There is both sorrow and joy, bitterness and sweetness. God's word contains sweet promises and assurances, but it also contains bitter warnings and prophecies of judgment. So the angel commissions. He commissions John and tells him that he is to go and to prophesy. He is to go and call people to repentance. And he will be a prophet to many people, nations, tongues, and kings. So we find here the record to us in the Word of God, clear instruction. Clear instruction about the, the promises of God that will be fulfilled. And that he will bring and execute judgment upon the wicked and he will chastise his people to bring them to repentance. So this is the witness of this great angel. It's chapter 10 is all dedicated to this mighty angel and for what he has instructed John to do. That for sure, for sure, this is going to come to pass. Then we go to chapter 11. And in chapter 11 is the record for us of the two witnesses. The two witnesses. And uh, this is a time now when the, the temple is rebuilt. We talked about that uh, in our refresher last week, that uh, in, in the tribulation period, the beginning of the tribulation period, Israel will have a restoration of their uh, temple worship and sacrifices will be restored. And uh, so here we find that there is this earthly temple in chapter 11, verse 1, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and an angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. What we understand from these first two verses is that the, this temple uh, is going to be trodden by the Gentiles, for 42 months. 42 months equates to, uh, 30, uh, to three and a half years. All right, to three and a half years. So we find that this is what's going to take place. And we'll read more about that when we get into chapter 13, where Antichrist, filled with Satan, and he will enter into that temple. He will uh, go back on his negotiation or his covenant with Israel and he will enter into that temple and set up his image and will force people to, to worship him as being God. All right, so here the Lord is telling John that there will be a time that you've got your temple now, but there's going to come a time where the Gentiles are going to take hold of that temple. And so verse 3 tells us, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Here now, the Lord's going to give these two men, these two prophets, these two witnesses, who will be out of Jerusalem, who will be there in that temple, and that they will be given power and authority to do great works, great measures uh, there before people. They will prophesy for 1,260 days, which are the first three and a half years. 42 months, 1,260 days uh, is the same, three and a half years. And remember that a Jewish calendar uh, of a year is made up of 360 days, not as our Gregorian calendar of 365. So when you take uh, 1,260 divided by 360, you will get three and a half years. And so they will minister there in that temple for three and a half years. And uh, they are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God of the earth. Some people say, is this Moses and Elijah? 
Uh, no, it's not Moses and Elijah. The Bible here is very clear. It gives us a picture of what is in Zechariah uh, of, this two, of the two olive trees, which are resemblance of Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua in the Old Testament, where they, tra- where they came back from captivity uh, under Cyrus, the king, and went back and rebuilt the temple with a lot of Gentile uh, opposition. Do you remember uh, when you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah? Uh, we find that in the book of Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah, where, uh, Ezra, when they tried to build, uh, you know, they had great opposition. There was great opposition by the Gentile world at that time. And so here, what we find is that these two witnesses are similar to Zerubbabel and to uh, to Joshua, who will do mighty works in that time. And when Israel is trying to uh, develop and restore their their temple and restore uh, their ability to sacrifice. So here he gives them mighty work, mighty, mighty power. And what, what will they do? Uh, verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Uh, they, they were given great authority and great power from heaven uh, that no one will be able to destroy them. But there will be one. One will be given this, uh, this privilege. One will be given this power to overcome them. And that is Antichrist. When we find that Antichrist is making his move in the middle of the tribulation, he can only enter into that temple and set up his image by removing these two witnesses. Uh, He is the one who's going to kill them. And the Bible tells us in verse 6, These have power to shut heaven, that it may not in days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. And they, when they shall have finished their testimony, so once they've done their ministry for that 1,260 days, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And you say, well, no man is able to destroy them beforehand. They had great power to devour anyone who opposed them. They called fire from heaven. They called floods. And they, they destroyed those who opposed them and opposed Israel. But now we find that, the, that Antichrist is given that ability. That beast that sends out of the bottom of the speech shall make war against them. And he shall overcome them and kill them. And it's interesting what the next verse is saying. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. So this is in reference now of Jerusalem. Their bodies will lie dead there uh, in Jerusalem, uh, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. Uh, this is what's going to happen. The Antichrist will have them killed. Uh, their bodies will lie for three days. So it's a period of time that their bodies will be there and it will be televised worldwide. Uh, everybody around the world is going to see that these two, the, these two prophets, these two witnesses have been executed and killed. Uh, and uh, they will not give them a, a, a burial. Uh, they, they will not bury them. They will leave them there to rot. As far as they're concerned, is we have overcome. Uh, the world's going to think they conquered God's representatives. They have won. Uh, but the Bible tells us that in their celebration, in those three days, uh, they celebrated by giving gifts one to another. Uh, the Bible tells us this in verse, uh, verse number 9, and they, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies, uh, three days and a half, and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. It's going to be a celebration. Uh, people are going to have a great celebration, almost like a Christmas time. Uh, they're going to rejoice, and they're going to exchange presents and gifts, and say, we overcome them. Uh, we have got rid of those who have made our life such a, uh, uh, so hard with, with all these judgments that have fallen upon us. We have removed them out of our way. Isn't it amazing that the heathen, the Bible tells us, why do the heathens rage? And the kings of the earth imagine a vain thing. Psalm 2. Uh, they want to cast asunder the authority of God from their life. They don't want God, nor his presence, nor his influence, nor his testimony amongst them. So here, the, the wickedness 
of society and people will be that they will see these witnesses being overcome by Antichrist. They will leave their bodies for three and a half days and they will not bury them and they will rejoice over their death and exchange presents. And they will, uh, they will make such a, a merry time over this incident. But we want us to see that even though they were martyred that day, that the Lord is going to quicken them. Verse 11, And after three days and a half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Well, isn't that going to be amazing? Right? Like, here they were, they're rejoicing, giving presents, saying, hey, we won, we won, we won. And then three and a half days later, the Spirit of the Lord these dead bodies that are, have been left in the city, unattended to, their spirit is going to be brought back and they're going to come to life. Now you, you can just imagine everybody's joy is just going to, what? We, we thought we won. What? And, uh, and so they are brought back to life and this is again a testimony and, and a judgment upon people and uh, the Lord is going to take them the Bible tells us uh, in verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Can you imagine that? Imagine that, that they're going to see their dead bodies being resurrected, and then they're going to hear a voice that says, Come up hither, and they're going to see them rise up into heaven. And you can imagine how much fear is going to fall, fear and trepidation is going to fall on people at that time. Now, this is not a picture of the church. Now, some people, you hear some people saying that uh, the two witnesses and their resurrection uh, uh, and, and ascension into heaven with those words, come up hither, is an indication about the church being raptured in the middle of the tribulation period. Uh, my friend, that, that is wrong because of the fact that these two witnesses were executed and killed. At the time of the rapture, not all believers are going to be dead and executed. Right? And we who are alive shall also be caught up to be with them, with, with, with the Lord. And so shall be, we'll be with the Lord forevermore. So this is not a reflection of the church being taken up. And this shows us that God is putting a sign and showing the world at that time that judgment is coming. Uh, you know what is, what's so great about our God? Is that even in his wrath, he's giving chance and mercy to people for, to repent. Uh, he's given them time to repent. Uh, even in all these signs and wonders, he wants people to repent. He wants people to come to know him, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and be saved. God wills that none should perish, but that men will come to repentance and to know Jesus Christ. And so, again, we see the mercy of God. With great power, he, he raises these, these uh, witnesses and they ascend into heaven. And so, the earth dwellers the, dwelt, the earth dwellers at that time uh, will see this exactly for what God is doing. Their fear will increase with a great earthquake. Look how this concludes in verse 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake. And the tenth part of the city of Jerusalem will fall. And in the earthquake were slain, were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God, to the God of heaven. There's going to be a great earthquake. At their ascension, in their resurrection and ascension, then there will be a great earthquake where a tenth of the city will be destroyed. 7,000 people will die in that earthquake, in that, in that tragedy. And people will be affrighted. People will be afraid. Fear will fall upon mankind. And those who believe in God will see his glory in what he is accomplishing. Well, that's our second list of testimonies that God is declaring the time has come. And the final testimony we want to consider tonight is the testimony of the elders, which is from verse 15 to 19. This comes at the conclusion of the seventh trumpet sound. Verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. What a great declaration. A great declaration was given in heaven that the kingdoms of the earth have fallen. Now, Jesus has not claimed his throne yet. 
Jesus has not taken the rightful throne, but there's a celebration of assuredness and certainty affirming that this is going to take place, that Jesus will reign, that Jesus will take his rightful throne, uh, that at the end of this period, Christ will conquer and will triumph. You, you know, uh, when you're feeling distressed and you're seeing that evil is, uh, uh, is uh, overcoming and evil is so prevalent in this world, I want you to understand that the back of the book tells us that Jesus will triumph over evil. I want you to know that we, as his bride, as his church, as believers, uh, we will reign with him. Uh, he will usher in a kingdom of a, of a thousand years where he will rule with a rod of iron and uh, we will be priests and kings with him. And so he, when we read the back of the book, we understand that Jesus triumphs. Jesus is, uh, is going to conquer all kingdoms under his authority. And so heaven declares that. In verse 16, And the four and twenty elders which sat, which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and has reigned. They're already declaring the triumph of Jesus. They're already declaring that Jesus uh, is, uh, is king. And I want you to know today that Jesus is king. Uh, he might be ruling over a, a spiritual kingdom right now, but one day he's going to have a physical kingdom in which he will reign here on earth, and he will rule with great power. And this acclamation of of, uh, of of praise to him. And look what it says in verse 13. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. They're proclaiming praise to the Lord. For what reason? The acclamation is that Christ reigns supreme. Uh, that he will judge righteously. Uh, he's going to judge uh, the unsaved, but he's also going to give a reward judgment to the Christians. Uh, you and I, who have believed on Jesus Christ, are going to stand before the beamer seat of Christ. Uh, there we are going to be rewarded for the works that we have done in the flesh. Uh, the Lord is going to be the judge of the earth. He will judge Christians according to their works and give them rewards accordingly and he will judge the rest of the world because of their wickedness and the Bible tells us in Revelation 20 when we get there later on is we find that a great white throne and the books are open and every man is judged according to their works you see God always has a righteous judgment God is just in his judgments uh, you, you can't swindle him you can't bribe him you can't make him do things. Uh, he will always even the books out. Uh, he will open the books for what we have done, what we have said, ha what we have done in our bodies, and the Lord will reward accordingly. Some of us, our, our, as, the, as Paul tells us in Corinthians, that some of our works are going to be tried with fire, and some of it is going to come out in hay, wood, or stubble, which means it's just going to poof, it's going to disappear. We would have thought that we should get rewarded for it, but we'll find it has no eternal value. And some of it is going to come forward as gold and as gemstones and that will be to the glory of God for all of eternity. The Lord is a righteous judge. And this is what the elders in heaven are proclaiming and declaring, Lord, you are righteous in your judgment. You will judge the earth. You will judge the dead. You will judge those who are angry with you. And may I say, why is the world angry with God? Why are they angry with him? Uh, why is it that they say he, uh, that, that the nations were angry and our wrath is come? Why were they angry at God? God has given them every chance to repent with mercy. They're angry because they've seen his power. They've seen that they cannot get away with their wickedness. They cannot get away with what they want. And they're angry against God because they don't want him in their life. And they, don't want he, they, don't, they don't want his authority. They don't want him to reign over them. And they want to be their own gods. And that they, they believe that lie from Satan, Lucifer himself. So the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And that word here, that the wrath is come, is that the time to settle, the time to settle uh, God's judgment is here. Uh, God does not lose control uh, over his faculty or over his emotions. 
God is not like you and me where somebody might do something or say something that we don't like and we just explode in anger and rage. No, God is very much composed and very much controlled. He's righteous in his judgment. And when he ex- executes his judgment in wrath, people will know. With no shadow of a doubt, they will know why God is, ex- is executing his wrath upon them. And so we find that Christ reigns supremely, he judges righteously, and he rewards graciously. And lastly, we find that there is now some assurance being given. Verse 19, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. We see here a picture in heaven that the Lord opens that temple and there we see the ark. Now, you know the ark in the Old Testament was where the Lord met, the, met Aaron, met the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement and he would come in to sprinkle the blood. And now what here we find is that the Lord is saying uh, that he is sure He is sure in his judgment. He is sure in his presence. He is sure that he will still extend mercy to anyone who would call upon him. Even in the last three and a half years, you say, will anybody get saved in the last three? Yes, God is still merciful to save those in the last three and a half years. It's not over. It's not over. The Bible does say, though, however, that any man who takes on the mark of the beast uh, has sold his soul and sold, sold himself to Satan. But anyone who refuses, refuses to take the mark of the beast, and there will be those there will be those who will not take it. And there will be those who are skeptical over governments having such authority and power over them. And they still have an opportunity. They will still have an opportunity to receive the mercy of God and to be saved. And so we find here that there is from heaven, uh, there in God's mercy in the temple, uh, there's lightnings and voices and thunderings. Whenever you read about lightnings and thunderings and, uh, and shaking, be sure that what is to follow is some horrific stuff. Be sure to understand that what is to follow is some great judgment, some great things that God is going to execute here on earth. So we will pick up from Revelation 12, where we'll see how Satan is going to be cast down to this earth, and then he will embody Antichrist, and Antichrist will become that world leader who will establish his kingdom out of Jerusalem and set up his throne in the temple of God and expect people to worship him. So we're now towards the middle, right? We're towards the middle of the tribulation period. These scenes that we've seen tonight are just a prelude, a prelude of confirmation of what is to come and how the Lord will deal with the wickedness of humanity. Imagine that, despite God's mercy, and wondrous works uh, during those three and a half years trying to call people to repentance, the people of the world are going to be angry at him and that they are not going to repent and they're not going to repent of their their wicked ways. They're not going to repent of their idols of silver and gold. They're going to continue to do what they want. And, uh, you know, today as we look into our world, as people uh, go on and people are stubborn and stiff-necked and and, uh, they will not repent, Uh, even though God is calling everyone into into repentance, let me assure you of this one thing. God is still gracious and merciful and will save to the uttermost those who will call upon him. There is time. There is time. So we want to do everything we can, everything we can, to reach people with the gospel. So I want to challenge you and invite you that you will invite someone to our meetings this coming weekend especially Friday night. Friday night is specific as an evangelistic outreach. And we want to invite any one of our colleagues, friends, family, people who we work with, maybe we study with, we want you to pray and be courageous enough to invite someone to come and hear a gospel message on Friday night. Pastor Chapel will preach a gospel message and we want to try to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to show people that they can be saved. Today, the Lord is calling them to salvation. Behold, today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. So we ought to do all we can. Would we have mercy 
and compassion on others? Would you have mercy and compassion on someone? And would you invite them to hear the gospel? The Lord is merciful in his nature. Despite all the judgments that will fall, he still is seeking to save those who will call upon him. Would we work with the Lord? Will we work in his field? Will we take it upon us to reach someone? May God help us during this week to have boldness to speak to someone and invite them that they will hear the gospel call on Friday night. All right, well, this is, these are the three testimonies. Has anybody got any question about these three that we talked about this evening? We've got a couple of minutes before we close. Why are they there? Why did the Lord record them for us? Well, to show us the certainty and affirmation that the Lord will conclude evil here on earth. Any questions? Yeah. Can we get a mic, please, to Brother Michael? questions. So it's just regarding the two witnesses and the identity. So there's a lot of people that talk about it being Moses and Elijah. And just one of the things that, uh, that, it came, that I just came across as we were looking at those verses was talking about how the, the reigning fire and of course the two, the two, uh, the two prophets, uh, Moses obviously uh, you know, in, in uh, Book of Numbers in particular, um, you know, God often uh, rained fire as uh, judgment. And then you had Elijah, obviously, when he was in the mountain and, you know, they came to arrest him and rained down fire. Uh, so there's, there's potential that. And then there's also the power over the weather. But I just wonder if there's other, if there's other arguments uh, regarding Moses and Elijah. But I do, I mean, I take the point. Okay. I think it more points to Zechariah. Okay, thank you. Yes, there are many who speculate. But, you know, uh, but Jesus did say that Elijah had come. Right, so they were waiting for Elijah. Jesus said, Elijah has come. Who was Elijah that came? John the Baptist. All right, John the Baptist had come. All right, so, and the correlation here is because it talks about the, the, these are the two olive trees. So when you, when you talk about the two olive trees and you go back to the book of Zechariah, that is an indication and it's, and it's in reference to these two men who was one, Zerubbabel, or was, uh, uh, was a descendant of David, so he was of a rightly throne, okay, a kingly throne, and Joshua, who was the high priest at that time. And they both, uh, if you read in the book of Ezra, they both went back uh, to rebuild the, the temple. They went back there to rebuild the temple, to restore worship. But they had great opposition from the Samaritans and the Gentiles that the work came to a standstill. For 14 years, nothing happened. And then we find Haggai comes and says to them, is it time? Is it time for you to build your houses and to build what you have and you've neglected my house? As a re Reconsider your ways. And Zechariah comes back with another encouragement saying, these two will be empowered by the Spirit of God to help you restore this, uh, this worship. So uh, I, I believe when in, in that particular uh, verse in, in Revelation where we hear about these other two olive trees, that's in reference to what, the, what Zechariah says. And, and so I think it's more in reference. When you look at it uh, in context, these are the two witnesses at the time where, where now the temple is rebuilt and worship is being restored, but there's great opposition by the Gentile world. All right? But they will sustain and they will prophesy and anyone who opposes them, they, uh, nobody can come before them. They, they will bring fire or destroy them. Uh, but until Satan, uh, until Antichrist himself comes uh, to that place. So once they've ministered their time, their ministry is only for three and a half years, that 1,260 days. Uh, once their ministry is over for that three and a half years, Antichrist will overcome them and will kill them. And so we find that the similarity between those two witnesses is the resemblance of Zerubbabel and Joshua who tried to restore temple worship, restore the temple in great opposition by the Gentiles. Does that make sense? Okay, a any, any other questions? All right, all good. How many people would be happy to go home? Say amen.
Fine, amen. Don't be shy. I know you want to go home. Don't be shy. All right, let's pray and we conclude. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you for the events that have been recorded to us and they are for our learning. And uh, Lord, help us as we understand uh, your promises and your word, uh, that it is affirmed. And the things that you say, Lord, uh, are going to come to pass, are actually going to happen. And so we claim your promises even tonight. We thank you for your word that is sweet in our mouth. It rejoices our heart. It uh, brings comfort. But also, Lord, we know when it rebukes us and when it shows us of uh, displeasure and judgment uh, that it, it may make us uncomfortable. But, Lord, thank you that your word is truth. And thank you, Lord, that it is there for us to mature us and to perfect us unto all good works. We love you. We thank you for what we've studied tonight. Be with your people throughout this week. Help us all to be conscious of others that need the gospel. And we take time to share with them. And, and Lord, would you give us courage that we would invite many to come and hear the message on Friday night, a gospel message proclaimed. And Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work in us, through us. And with the services of next week, Lord, would you reign over it? Would you bless it? Would you empower us? Would you equip us? Would you transform us? that we would please you in these last days. We'll give you all thanks now in Jesus' name.